Hi everybody, um, I'm Nicola McEwen. I'm a professor of politics at the University of Edinburgh and apologies for disrupting the order of things. I thought I was going to have to take my daughter to a birthday party, so the all important mum jobs um, that tend to dominate the weekends. Um, but anyway, luckily I'll be able to join you for, for the whole session. So the questions I was asked to, to think about um, are whether some basic features of the democratic system should be difficult for governments to change? And the short answer uh, I would give to that would be yes, but um, it depends on how we do that. What kinds of checks and balances would we need to have in the system to protect against a majority ruling at the cost of a minority? And who gets to hold those checks? Who gets to decide on what the check should be and when governments should or shouldn't uh, be able to, to change things. I mean, the first body uh, to think about there in terms of checks and balances is the role of parliament. Government makes and implements policy, but parliament makes laws, parliament scrutinises the government, parliament holds governments to account. But how much of a check that is in fact for on government's decisions, depends on the type of system that we have and the type of powers that parliament has and who makes up uh, the parliament. It's especially linked to the type of voting system that we have. So in the UK parliament, the voting system is first past the post. It's sometimes colloquially, colloquially oh gosh, that's a hard word to say on a Saturday. Sometimes it's known as a winner takes all uh, system. So it tends to produce majority governments usually made up of one party and usually on the basis of a minority of votes. So if it only takes a majority vote to change things, then in practice it's not really that much of a check on government decision-making. But proportional representation systems, these are the types of electoral systems where the, the number of members elected by a party more broadly corresponds to its share of the vote, that tends to change the power between government and parliament. It often produces governments that have a minority or that have to have other partners in a coalition. So that can change the, the power that parliament has in relation to government. But we can also uh, do some other things. So make some democratic decisions need more than just half of the vote uh, in parliament, maybe um, changing something like changing the term of office of a government or changing the voting system that we have. Maybe that should require super majority. So maybe two thirds of the votes in parliament, for example, that kind of decision-making is quite common uh, in other countries. It's not very common in, in this one. Also, it depends on how independent minded parliamentarians are or not. So if they are going to follow strict party lines and just support the government because it's their party or oppose the government because they're in opposition, then that again is limiting the extent to which they act as a check on the actions of governments. There are other things that can be done too around constitutional protections. By a constitution, I mean the rules uh, that underpin the political system, the democratic system, the types of rules that are supposed to last between different governments, last for a longer time, some of the fundamental features of the system. And in countries that have a codified constitution, a, a, usually a single document, um, setting out all of the rules and characteristics of the system, that tends to be um, upheld and checked and protected uh, by a constitutional court. So that can be more long lasting. It can provide extra protections uh, in the system on what governments can do. Um, you would have to have some sort of clear process for how you change a constitution. Again, that might be about super majorities in parliament, it could be a referendum, it could be having and ensuring that there's support in different regions of the country, not just 
the most populous areas where, where people live. This was suggested for the Brexit referendum, for example, that maybe that should have needed a majority support in the different constituent nations of the UK. And um, that was proposed certainly by some of them, but that didn't happen. So again, how much protection that adds um, depends on what would be in the constitution. Potentially, the downside is it takes um, some power and authority away from elected politicians and puts it in the hand of the judges who are, after all, a very privileged elite and not elected and not accountable uh, to anybody else. And they're certainly not representative. And it can be more difficult to change things when you're so focused on what's in the constitution because they are designed to last. That could mean that they are a wee bit out of date. You know, some rules that were designed and made and seemed the right thing in the last century might not suit um, the one that we live in now. And that brings me to uh, Proposition H. Some basic questions should be decided directly by the people rather than by government or parliament. And in any democracy, of course, the people are essentially important. Governments are ultimately accountable to the people at elections. How that works depends again on the electoral system. But what about referendums for the bigger things, the bigger decisions in a democratic system? Yes, again, I am broadly in favour of having referendums used in that way, but there are downsides to think about too. Referendums can be used to reduce things that are complex and complicated into a simple binary question, yes or no, remain or leave, in or out. And sometimes the, the purpose of doing that is to try to make the choice a relatively straightforward choice to make, but the, the implications of doing it in that way, the effect of doing that is to sometimes restrict the choice and force people into either one box or another box, when actually public opinion is usually spread a lot more uh, broadly. Referendums, because of that, can also be divisive and they can be exploited by people that want to appeal to simple options, us versus them, without being open about the difficult uh, challenges that are raised uh, by the issues being decided. So if referendums are to be used in that way, I think it's really important that options are as clear as possible with a process, perhaps a citizens' assembly, um, of public debate, of learning, of awareness raising, uh, so that people are, are, have the knowledge and the power to participate in the process in the best possible way. And let's try to design referendums and to pose questions that match the issues. Issues are rarely black and white, so we shouldn't pretend that they are by making the choices appear simple. And there are ways to design a referendum that helps to reflect the reality and the complexity of the choices on offer. Thank you very much.